Hello, everybody. Welcome to another We Three live series. Uh, I'm Dylan Lockwood, and I am excited to introduce this panel on or this talk on Hawaii's cutting edge climate tech regulation uh, with, with my friend Lorraine. Uh, so uh, with that, I will pass it to uh, SCW's Chief Strategy Officer and GM of Europe, George Hunt. George, take it away. Thanks very much, Dylan, and um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, from wherever you are listening to this today. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, talking to our guest today. Uh, our guest is Lorraine Akiba, who's President and CEO of LHA Ventures. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a short introduction about uh, Lorraine's career, and then I'm going to allow Lorraine to introduce herself, which I'm uh, really excited about. And, and then we'll get, we'll talk about the topic, which is a particularly uh, interesting one today. So let's, let's get going. Um, Lorraine is a recognized thought leader uh, with technical expertise and knowledge in the development of Hawaii's renewable and clean energy policy and regulatory framework. Um, given this diverse professional background, she also provides senior policy services in other regulated industries, uh, industry sectors and expertise for development of corporate, environmental, social and governance goal, government governance goals and metrics for publicly traded companies. She also serves as a commissioner on the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, which presides over all regulated public utility matters, including electric, gas, private water, wastewater, and telecommunications, water transportation, and motor carrier transportation utilities. Uh, prior to this, uh, she worked in private practice as a law partner at McCorriston Miller Mackay McKinnon LLP, and Carter's Shoot LLP. Uh, she headed the environmental practice groups at both law firms with an emphasis on environmental and natural resources law, in addition to her commercial and business litigation practice. She continues many leadership roles now in various national and international organizations, including the city and county of Honolulu Resilience Strategy Steering Committee, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council Board of Directors, and the US Japan Council. She also is a member of the OPARA Industry Council and the US Department of Environment Research Advisory Council for the Lift Solar Project. A little bit more because it's so impressive. Um, Lorraine previously served as a member of the Advisory Council to the Board of Directors of Electric Power Research Institute, the Board of Directors of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners and its Energy Resources and Environmental Committee, the US DOE and the Lawrence Barkley National Laboratory Future Electric Utility Regulation Advisory Group and the State and Local Efficiency Action Network Financial Solutions Working Group. Lorraine also holds a Juris Doctor from the University of California, Hastings College of Law and graduated with honors from the University of California at Berkeley in political science. Goodness me, what an amazing career, what an amazing background. To talk to you today. So first of all, let, let me welcome you to week three. Um, we're going to talk about something I'm particularly interested in. So how are you? How are you today? I'm doing fine. And, um, you know, aloha, George. I mean, here I am in Hawaii and there you are in the UK, uh, the wonders of modern technology. And despite COVID, we're able to have this dialogue, which I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you for such a, a warm introduction. Um, it's really important, you know, what we're talking about today. And I'm just, I'm glad that similarly minded and interested folks like, uh, like you, George, even if you're, you know, two oceans away from me, um, we're working on some of the similar things. So there's that synergy, which I believe is a really a, a positive influence uh, uh, for, for us in these very challenging times. No, fantastic. And as I say, uh, a very warm welcome, aloha um, to you as well. Uh, it, it's a real privilege to talk to you. And, and the topic today is of particular interest. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to use the context of the latest on Hawaii's cutting edge uh, climate tech regulations, um, and we're going to discuss two topics that we that I think we rarely get the chance to discuss. Um, the first one is uh, a fantastic example of innovative and progressive regulation, and the second one is tariff enabled resilience and reliability. So we're going to talk yes. pretty much about those two things. So so let's get to it. Um, so let, first of all, we're going to talk about Hawaii's. Uh, performance-based regulation framework. Um, 
designed as a set of regulations to align the Hawaii electric financial interests with Hawaii's clean energy goals. Um, and then we're going to talk about the microservices tariff uh, that's recently been introduced in Hawaii Electric to promote and support generation locally and on a smaller scale. So, Mark, but before we get on to that, um, I just want you to talk a little bit more about your amazing career and, and all the experience that you had that I, I sort of shared in the introduction. And tell me a little bit about the, the, the major career moments in your life, the pivotal uh, choices that you made in your career and, and how you ended up getting here today. And also, what, what do you see as the, the key game changers during your career? Yeah, you know, I think I, I think what really drives me, and I probably you know inherited this from my from my parents, um, you know, who are second generation Japanese Americans, and 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 dealt with a lot of experiences, uh, you know, culturally diverse community here in Hawaii. Um, although my mom, uh, you know, it, it was a great influence, and she was actually uh, stuck in um, in Japan, uh, you know, during World War II, and she, you know, they're a little older parents than compared to you know some of my. my, my my peers, but you know they gave me a perspective on on global uh, interconnection, and and I also have a strong base in terms of cultural diversity and and values of of being here, born and raised in Hawaii, because of Native Hawaiian culture and values of stewardship of our environment, stewardship of the planet, respect not only for each other but respect for. Uh, resources that we are, are merely stewards of while we are here on this planet. So I think I draw from a lot of those cultural, uh, unique cultural things about me, given my, you know, my cultural heritage, being here from Hawaii. And those are what have uh, inspired me and also, uh, you know, motivated me. Uh, it, it, it's very hard, you know, I think as just as a woman professional, there's many things that women face and challenges that we face. But uh, I that has made me even more aware of the need to be um, uh, open to addressing challenges, to being positive and to accomplishing things. And if that means that you work 200% harder to get somewhere, uh, to overcome some of these challenges, to overcome some of these barriers, that's what's motivated me. And like I said, my mom was a, you know, a role model for me. She's like one of the first um, you know, uh, Japanese American women physicians to practice in Hawaii. and. She was a very dedicated public servant. She could have been in private practice, but she, because of uh, sacrificing for me as a parent and wanting to have more regular hours, became um, a physician for you know the state of Hawaii um, uh, tuberculosis branch. And she spent many long hours, very dedicated in her job. But uh, so I've I've learned from from not only my personal family, but again, like I said, being blessed here with the cultural values that we share in Hawaii. Uh, and and it's uh, you know many of us in Hawaii come from immigrant, initially immigrant families who came here to work on the sugar and pineapple plantation. So we have a very strong um, a bond in that. We also have a strong respect for diversity of cultures, language, food, uh, you know, uh, that this is what makes Hawaii so special and unique. And truly, as I said, Native Hawaiians have taught us the spirit of aloha, not only for people, but for the land and for the resources that we are in. Uh, been given the, the great responsibility to be stewards for while we are here. So as far as game changers, let me think, game changers in my career, I think it's just being at the right place at the right time in terms of, of renewable energy and, um, and whether it's because of the challenge of climate change and what's happening um, globally. Uh, you know, Hawaii has been a leader and I think the game changer for not only us as a state, but for the rest of the the, the country, if not the world we were leaders in, is trying to get to 100% renewable energy and uh, with a very ambitious goal of, of 2045. But there are now other jurisdictions. I mean, I'm working with the government of Barbados, uh, you know, a small island in the Caribbean that's trying to get there to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And I've, I've heard that number, you know, from the Biden administration, 2030. So we are pushing ourselves. And I think that's the, the game changer that we can become uh, you know, renewable and clean uh, energy um, uh, communities, uh, each in many states and cities, not just this, uh, you know, uh, at the federal or national level, but there are communities that are committed to this. Fantastic. Um, that's a, such an amazing background for what we're going to talk about. Um, before we get on to the detail of what's happening in Hawaii and what you're observing, 
around the world as well. Um, can you can you share a little bit about the particular challenges in Hawaii? What um, what are the specifics sure. in Hawaii that, that that sort of have helped to drive uh, some of what we're going going to talk about with the regulation and the tariffs? Yeah, George. You know, as I always say. Islands, island communities are, are at ground zero for climate change. And we, you know, I, I'm gonna uh, borrow a quote from Nainoa Thompson, who's the head of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. You know, Polynesian voyagers in ancient times, they circumnavigated the globe in canoes using only the, uh, the stars to navigate. I mean, and it was an oral tradition that was passed down from generation to generation, but it's just amazing, again, they based their, their lifestyle on sustainability, taking care of the planet and, and being mindful of resources. But they were they were world travelers, you know, before we had jets and boats and trains and whatever technology, they were doing this by virtue of the stars. And 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 island people are, you know, we we we're all connected by water. So there's a great appreciation for that resource as well. And, and the Polynesian Voyaging uh, Society leader, Nainoa Thompson always talks about, we are the blue, you know, we are the blue continent. When you think about it, how much water there is and, and, and less landmass. And we are islands that are, are connected in that blue continent um, and a significant, uh, you know, whether you call it the canary in the coal mine, but just a significant precursor of what can happen uh, throughout, uh, you know, of the globe and so island people are very conscious of that and there is you know you can't just uh you know run off the island so you know you have to deal with it as a community as an island so basically you can see that with climate change i mean sea level rise water impacts um whether that's drought on certain island communities a lack of fresh water uh you know more climate uh, impacts with hurricanes typhoons uh, you see that earthquakes. I mean, we're many islands are are subject to all of those kinds of environmental um, stressors, and therefore, and because resources are constrained as island people, we know we have to work together. I mean, the analogy being, we must roll in the canoe together in order to get to the destination. So I think that is what is unique about Hawaii, and that is what has driven some of the you know the the leadership on energy. Uh, you know, in the water area and in the environmental area, and particularly what what drove uh, some of the commitment, um, because really there's a there wasn't conflict. I mean, people agree that we need to get to 100% renewable energy. To say you're devils in the details, how do we do that? Um, so you can see that um, uh, that's where it's hard. To, it's we align on the policies, but it, you know, when it comes to actual implementation. Um, but I think we've had many best practices. We've learned some of from our mistakes and we're also been a leader in sharing those um, uh, with others, not only across the US, but you know, across the world. But island people definitely uh, feel the impacts much quicker and there's less opportunities um, uh, you know, uh, to mitigate without having some self-sufficiency and sustainability. You know, help, when there's a hurricane, help is not a truck roll away. You're an island, isolated. So you must be much more sustainable and resilient uh, in, in uh, dealing with these challenges. I, I, think, I think there's a couple of things there that really caught my attention. I mean, it was all, all fantastic, but a couple of things that I was thinking about in terms of what, what mainland countries can learn about this too. And one, one is really being connected to the challenges within your environment. You know, you can't walk away from them because you're living within them in the island community. And the, 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 the second one that really caught my attention was um, uh, the, 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 the fact that you're, you, 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 you get behind the outcome here um, as a community and the power of the people working together uh, to do that. So um, just, just before we, we move on, I think, I think there are some lessons on focus, some lessons on engagement, some lessons on understanding and education around the challenges as well, which, which, which sort of came to mind from what you were saying. Um, we, we, we're going, we, on, on the We3 channel, we've, we've had some amazing speakers that have talked about uh, the technology side of the equation here, the, the research and development, the new, the new technologies, etc. It's not often that we get the chance to sort of look at the other end of the spectrum here and say, how does the role of regulation play its part? How does the role of 
you know, incentivize tariffs that actually promote innovation and promote engagement. So, so those are the two things that I think uh, are particularly interesting about what we're going to talk about today. So the, the, two, the two things that I, I know you've been really active on, the first one is the, uh, the performance-based regulation framework. Um, and I say, it's described as a comprehensive set of utility regulations uh, designed to align Hawaiian electric financial interests with Hawaii's clean energy goals. Um, and, and this is this is why policy regulation uh, and legislation is, is something that I think is so important to help, help countries uh, address these challenges. So I, I, I'd quite like to take the next few moments and, and, and ask you to explain a little bit more about how did it come about, the key drivers, who was involved, what process did you take, et cetera. Um, uh, over to you, because I think, I think there's so much to learn here. Yeah, I, you know, in that sense, I think I was, I'm, I'm, um, I, I, I'm glad to see that in Hawaii, I think we, we realize that, you know, while we, we need to have innovation and there's a lot happening, grid, grid edge technology, that sometimes um, the regulatory process, the regulatory framework can actually impede that, especially traditional cost of service um, regulation where you know, when you, most of the resources are, are spent on rate cases, which are an incredible expenditure of time and effort, not only by utilities that are regulated you know, by the regulatory agency, but the staff involved, all the stakeholders that are involved in those proceedings. And you know, regulation moves under that legacy system very slowly. And sometimes it can be counter or impede or undermine you know, the, the transformation that we seek. In, in Hawaii, you know, I was proud to be part of the, the, as you mentioned in my background, you know, when I was a public utilities commissioner uh, from 2012 to 2018, I was part of a very a dynamic transformational time. You know, things were happening um, because of the high price of, of oil and the economic impacts on our citizens in Hawaii. There was a lot of uh, focus on that, not only at the legislature, but also, you know, in, in the governor's office, the governor that appointed me, uh, you know, was very concerned about high energy costs, impacts on people's health. People were making decisions not to, uh, you know, buy medicine or food or, uh, you know, because of the, the, uh, the high prices of electricity and, and amazingly enough in our jurisdiction, people pay their electric bills and, but everything else kind of gets impacted. So there was a direct impact on the, on the quality of life of our citizens. So if a lot of attention on this and it was, it was a time of, of dynamic change. And so, you know, the, the, the team that we had in place, the commission at that time, we, you know, we drafted a very uh, seminal white paper called inclinations on Hawaii's utilities of the future. We, we, put forward a strategic roadmap to help um, guide our Hawaii utilities in, in forward, not only to achieve renewable energy, because in 2008, the Hawaii had already committed to Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative to get to 100%, 70%, uh, I think, uh, renewable energy and 30% with energy efficiency. So we have energy efficiency portfolio standards, we have renewable portfolio standards in place in Hawaii. And then, uh, you know, during the course of that, in like 2015, that became 100%. Um, initially by 2050 and, uh, and then later by 2045, so even more expedited. But that actually came, you know, from multiple fronts, whether the legislature, you know, with the renewable portfolio standards and energy efficiency, this, the commission itself as a regulator saying, this is what must change. And also looking at ourselves as regulators, that we must change the way we regulate because there are cert certain disincentives inherent in that system. And in order to make this more of a competitive market, because we do have a monopoly for, for most of our electric, uh, you know, and this is the case in many jurisdictions, it's not a retail market of electricity, it's a, a regulated monopoly um, or a, you know, a couple of dominant, a few dominant players that we need to be able to uh, concentrate on customers, affordability, and still make forward progress. And, and the legacy regulatory system sometimes impedes that. So, we talked about different things that could be done. Performance-based regulation being one of them where we focus on outcomes, goals, metrics, scorecards, measurable success. And that way the utility also can benefit from that and de-risking the regulatory process, which makes Wall Street and the investors happy. And also it benefits customers because you can share in those savings instead of, you know, 
it just being motivated by return on investment or return on equity. And if you over earn and you, you know, you rebate back, you know, a half a cent to your customers and ha instead having more flexibility to redirect cost savings to priority areas in our case, you know, with, um, with a lot of distributed energy resources is modernizing the grid infrastructure, which is very outdated. It's an old central spoke model, you know, where we delivered kilowatt hours to the customers and now you have more proactive prosumer customers. So the grid needs to be modernized, but that takes resources, that takes capital expenditure. So trying to figure out a system that we can incentivize utility to, to save and be cost effective and productive, but also share in that so that they can be incented as a business to do that, but then also be able to share that with customers, uh, you know, in a framework that, um, that uh, uh, facilitates that um, as, as best can be. So that's how it started, you know, back in 2014, uh, you know, we, we had some dockets that addressed decoupling because in Hawaii, the, the major utilities decoupled. Their, their earnings are not dependent on how much energy they sell as kilowatt hours. It's, it's on, based on other things that come, come to mind and, and performance-based regulation is is going to hopefully be a model for other jurisdictions to follow now because now it it is definitely centered around identified goals, um, outcomes, things that have been vetted with technical working groups and stakeholder input. And I think that's the distinguishing factor in Hawaii as well as our process, which I give credit to again the Public Utilities Commission that um, has continued this process. It's not the quickest process. But having stakeholder input, whether you have technical people weighing in, you also have community, environmental, all the stakeholders weighing in, the, 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 the tariff, the product, the framework that comes out of that is a, is a better process. It also has the buy-in of people that have to uh, uh, exist in that ecosystem and that regulatory framework. And so that's, I think that's the hallmark of what Hawaii has led on. Uh, with the, the process itself being many technical working groups, many stakeholder working groups, a lot of dialogue that goes into these issues ahead of time. And then the commission has decided and, 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 and made a decision in order to establish the performance-based regulatory framework, which actually we, we started the framework um, right before I ended my term and the current commission has taken it, you know, and now developed um, the actual framework, approved it um, and is it, completing the second phase, which is actually the performance measures, the metrics, the scorecards uh, for the major utility, um, you know, Hawaiian electric companies. The, I mean, I mean that, that's such a fantastic answer uh, and explanation in, into the background, but I, I think it's everything that you described is, is such a great example of how, um, how regulation can be used as a force for good, as a force for change, transformation, innovation. By, by taking a sort of proactive uh, front foot sort of approach to it. And, and, and I, I haven't seen a great many examples around the world. I, I've been involved in regulation myself for, for years and, and quite often it's all based around penalties, um, but, but there's nothing there in order to enable great service or enable the right choices to be made. And, and, and a lot of my background is in water where regulation was rewarding us for pouring concrete rather than promoting reuse of water. And, and, and although it's water, not electricity, the, the principles are fairly similar. So that, I, I, I really enjoyed hearing that explanation about how the framework came about, how the framework is going to make change and, and how the framework is being implemented now to change the outcomes uh, and also measure performance and accountability. So- Yeah, um, I mean, cause there's identified criteria, like you said, you know, I mean, it's not, I mean, the, unfortunately, the old system focused on um, capital expenditure. And we've, we've we, you and I had, you know, some conversation on this that, you know, CapEx is the measure for utilities to get financing, to get rated well by, you know, the Wall Street rating companies. But that's not always the, 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 the best outcome. The outcome really is not that you want to build more things, but you want to be more productive and use what you do have, the infrastructure. And also maybe now, you know, use behind the meter resources. And especially, for, for example, in the water area, water utilities, water companies are facing the same challenges from climate. And they are the largest customers for many energy and electric utilities. So energy companies, largest customers are, 
our water companies. And it makes sense that there would be some kind of synergy and coordination um, and, and, re, and incentivizing that so that uh, energy companies or uh, electric utilities uh, coordinate with their large customers, many times that are uh, commercial industrial uh, customers and water utilities are those, I mean, the highest cost when we used to look at water, uh, you know, cases was the energy costs, you know, to, to, to do, to provide clean water, to provide a service to custom water customers, to pump, to, to you know, to uh, ensure water quality, to treat, uh, you know, with its wastewater uh, appropriately. So there's a definitely energy water nexus. So it does affect everything. Performance-based regulation can also be there for water companies that they can focus more on outcomes, whether that's um, you know affordability, uh, you know water quality. We lost Lorraine here. Um, we'll just let Lorraine reconnect. But actually, 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 what Lorraine's talking about is is such a fascinating topic around the circular economy and the water energy nexus. Um, we, we we've got we've got some uh, some planned topics on we three over the coming weeks, uh, which are uh, safety uh, focus a little bit more. So, hi Lorraine, we lost you then for a moment, I think. Um, I don't know if you can hear me at all, but I just wanted to pick up on the water energy nexus and the circular economy. Um, yeah, we, we've lost Lorraine, so we'll just let Lorraine reconnect. Um, so go, one, one of the things that Lorraine talked about was was this idea of using regulation for a force for good, using regulation. Hi, you're back. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, it, it kind of like put me in this little spiral and I was like, where's okay. George? No worries. So I was I was feeling a little bit, you know, but but I was just feeling by saying that you know we're 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 broaching on a topic here which is really fascinating around the water energy nexus and also the circular economy between water and energy and putting turning waste into energy and and and, and companies using energy more efficiently and so on. So that, that that's a fantastic topic for us to consider uh, as a, as maybe a future one. Just while we've got a little bit of time left because it's just gone really fast. Can you just talk a little bit about the microservices tariff and how that what sure, sure. That, what that's playing yeah, in the it, framework? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's an interesting segue from water to that because actually many water utilities could be microgrids. And in fact, because of critical infrastructure, there's a lot of talk about that. But the microgrid services tariff kind of evolved out of a concern for resilience and reliability given the Im impacts of climate change. So in Hawaii, uh, we again, in that seminal 2014 inclinations of Hawaii's utilities, the future, we talked about microgrids, that we have to think differently, that instead of the traditional hub and spoke model, the central plant system, now with distributed energy resources, we need to use those more efficiently and effectively, put supply closer to load, think of new strategies, utilize grid edge technology that was innovation coming from all sectors uh, you know, in, in, of innovation uh, and many of these um, uh, very uh, cutting edge technologies that, that are now available as tools in the toolkit kit to help ensure reliability and adequacy of supply of, of energy to communities. And especially after we saw what happened with uh, Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria. And of course, Puerto Rico was the first to lead out with uh, their regulation 9028, which is, it established a very robust microgrid um, uh, system. But in Hawaii, we had Act 200, which the legislature put into place, which uh, required a microgrid services um, tariff structure. They delegated that again to the commission to implement. Uh, it's been a, a few years now. There's been again, technical working groups meeting, dialoguing as to what types of uh, microgrid services for resilience primarily. So this is in an emergency mode where, um, you stay connected to the grid during normal operations, but you can island off in order to avoid a whole island-wide blackout or cascading, you know, blackouts. And you can keep certain critical areas uh, powered, and and so that others maybe can come to those areas for power supply, whether that's campuses, hospitals, schools, you know, military bases, or many times microgrids. We have an operating microgrid Schofield generating station that was, you know. Um, uh, powered a, a few years ago that's a, a model and there's other customer sided uh, microgrids now that exist in Hawaii um, that don't use utility infrastructure but um, 
but the tariff itself provides for both customer microgrids as well as a hybrid, which might use, a, you know, meet multiple customers using some utility infrastructure to have a microgrid. Um, but it was primarily uh, uh, driven by resilience concerns. But now the next phase of the microgrid services tariff docket is, is uh, proceeding and talking about some concepts that you have come up in, in terms of rethinking the business model of utility, not so much being a seller of kilowatt hours, but being a manager of the grid and a conductor of all things, um, you know, uh, 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 on, on the grid, you know. Uh, and so uh, that um, we're talking about looking at wheeling and, um, and business to business type of transactions, which is feasible now because of blockchain technology. And I know some of the WE3 speakers have talked about, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain technology. You have all these technology tools now that can help deliver uh, energy in a whole different way um, among different stakeholders that you don't necessarily need the utility as being the only generator of energy, but you can, but really being more, like I said, the conductor of a complex things of, of, of the grid and everything. Um, you know, of those information systems that make up the grid. Uh, great. Um, and uh, as I say, it's such a progressive sort of piece of work that actually sort of feeds straight on the back of performance-based regulation into uh, a tariff mechanism that can promote innovation, promote transition, promote transformation. And, and, and I do agree, I agree completely. I think the utility of the future uh, are less likely to be generators and asset owners. They're more likely to be Sort of platform businesses or market operators or 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 aggregate aggregators in the market to bring things together. Um, we're 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 fast approaching our time limit. I, I just before we finish, I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, share a little bit more about your work as LHA Ventures. You ventured out on your own, and you're doing. You mentioned Barbados, and I know you've been to Iceland recently. So uh, I'd quite like to use the last few minutes, if that's okay, to if you can just share with us a little bit about. Where are you going? Where, where are you going with your business? Where, yeah, where? you know, I mean, I get, thank you. I guess I'm an example of there is life after being a commissioner. And I mean, I value that experience. And, you know, I still am in, in touch with many of the of the, the valuable members that are part of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners and with, you know, folks in Hawaii in the energy space. But right now as a consultant, I'm, you know, a senior policy advisor and a consultant on regulatory and energy policy, helping others, uh, you know, whether that's other countries, and I do a lot of work with NERIC International still in the Asia Pacific region, also in the Caribbean, mainly with a lot of island, um, island nations and developing nations that are trying to uh, continue on their journey for clean energy, renewable energy. I work uh, with the Asian Development Bank, with the Inter American Development Bank, um, uh, with clients that are, uh, you know, at, at a global level because, um, you know, we are a, a global village, right? I mean, it, it is really amazing how we do affect each other and there's many lessons to be learned. So dealing with that. So I think um, I it, it, it's really important um, for the policymakers and for those to learn from, you know, from whether that's learning from mistakes and best practices uh, so that people can continue to move forward. And I think that's part of the role that I really enjoy. Uh, and, you know, uh, even with COVID now that things are remote, uh, again, technology enables the fact that you and I can have this conversation and you're uh, in, in the UK, in London, and I'm here in Honolulu, Hawaii. So uh, we can still we can still do these things, although before, you know, I was traveling a lot um, and, and um, around the world to to do this work. Um, but it is very important. And um, climate change is, you know, the greatest existential threat and energy, water, resources, all those things, transportation. Those are all key factors in us addressing the challenges of climate change. And I think uh, we, I am um, inspired that um, there are similarly like-minded people across this world. And so it is a small community. The blue continent is a small community and we are aligned and there is a strong uh, commitment wherever I go. Uh, for the same reasons, because people are people and they understand that and they care about their communities and they care about their future and future generations. They wanna leave this world a better place for their children and their grandchildren. And that is very inspiring and gratifying to see that. And so I'm fortunate that I have now my consultancy uh, practice that I'm able to work with international folks as, as well as national, other national 
uh, uh, clients uh, and use my knowledge and what I learned in Hawaii and, and take that out and share that with the, with the, 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 the global village uh, and, and the ecosystem out there. Wow, what a, what a fantastic way to end our conversation today. Um, Lorraine, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed hearing about the, the things you've been working on and, and, and also just, just your passion, your energy, your, your commitment to something that you clearly care about so much and is clearly so important wherever we go in the world or wherever we look in the world. So let me just uh, say a massive thank you. Um, really enjoyed that. And, um, I hope, I, hope, uh, I hope everything goes fantastic with your new ventures as well as building on the things that you did with the commission and, and all the work before. So thank you so much and um, have a really great day. Thank you too. Aloha and mahalo, for, as we say in Hawaii. Aloha and mahalo, thank you uh, from Hawaii. And, and thank you very much, George, uh, for the work you do. Uh, it, it, because, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes every individual uh, across this this planet to do what we need to do right now. It's a very important time. And when, uh, so I think kudos out to all the folks that are listening today too for the role and the work they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.